If you will take your Bibles, turn with, them, turn with me in them to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 will serve as my text this morning. And for those of you who are home folk, you know we're going through 1 Thessalonians on Sunday mornings. When a few weeks ago, Kevin and Jake and Ben and I are in staff meeting and we're realizing that we had a missionary guest and Michael had been scheduled to speak and we realized there was going to be some time taken up for that. We had this mutual agreement. Kevin would give up about five minutes from the singing portion. I would give up about five minutes on the preaching side. Well, I've changed my mind. Uh, No, it is a little later than it normally is when I get up here, and I will do my best to keep that in in mind. My title this morning is Authentic Christianity. Authentic Christianity. Scams. We're hearing more and more about various kinds of scams. You might have someone call claiming to be someone representing the, the utility company, And they tell you that you've got this outstanding debt, you've got this bill, and if you do not pay it, by such and such a time, your utilities, your lights are going to be cut off. And for those of you who might have a little bit of a propensity toward worrying and fretting and believing anything and everything, you you just might be sucked in to a scam like that. Or there are some now, some cyber criminals, who are finding out the routing system to your banking account um, they're, they're discovering your tax return, and they get information. They file a false tax return that has a little bit of a refund that actually gets credited to your account. They then call you up, and then you verify, and you can see it. And they're now telling you those are unauthorized funds, and you need to return those, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they get scammed out of money. This morning, I'm afraid that people are being scammed, not necessarily out of their money by cyber criminals or by false utility workers, but some people are being scammed by Satan. You see, these cyber criminals tell lies. And because of the lies that people believe, they lose their money. Satan tells lies. And if you believe some of his lies, it could cost you your soul. It could cost you your soul. If we took a poll this morning, how many of you, now I'm not officially taking this poll, so I'm not looking for any raising of hands or anything, but how many of you would claim to be a follower of Jesus? How many of you would claim to be a Christian? Well, now, Paul had some things that he could see and observe in the lives of the Thessalonians that according to verse 4, convinced him, I know you're a part of God's elect. I can see your labor of love. I can see how you work because of your faith and you have patience there in verse uh, 3. And then we looked at it a couple of weeks ago, how he had all of this assurance that they had received the word. And then last week, we dropped down to verses 8 and 9, or verses uh, 6, 7, and 8. And there were various evidences of their life, visible, observable, noticeable evidences that they were truly believers. If Paul could come back right now and give him just a few weeks to watch your life, would he also say, I am convinced that you too are a part of God's elect? Because if you are, our text this morning will teach at least three realities of the authentic Christianity that Thessalonians fleshed out. And these are timeless. They are to be fleshed out by any believer, whether it's the first century or the 21st century. And so this morning... My purpose in preaching this message is to share with you three realities of authentic Christian living. If either of these three is missing from your life, it's possible that you're being scammed. Reality number one of authentic Christian living is you turn to God. You turn to God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves... Declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So 
When you and I come to know Jesus Christ is our Savior, there's turning that's involved. This speaks to our repentance, our coming to the realization that I am on the wrong path. It's a broad path. It's a downward path, if you will. It's a path that leads to destruction. And you come to the realization, unless I change my mind about the life I'm living, unless I change my mind about sin, unless I change my mind about Jesus, and unless I turn around, through repentance and go in a different direction, the direction the Lord would have me to go, the direction the scriptures say I'm supposed to go, the direction that leads through Jesus to eternal life, unless that happens, you will be damned. Turning is always involved in the process of living authentic Christianity. For the Thessalonians, they were a Roman city. And therefore, all the residents of Rome, or at least most, the vast majority of them, they worshiped idols like Apollos and Venus. They had a whole pantheon of gods that they worshiped. And they believed that the idols they worshiped would help placate the wrath of the deities, of the gods that they did worship. And then they came to realize, you know what? Even though our government is built on this kind of worship, even though our families are built on this kind of a worship, I've come to the realization it's left me empty. And so I'm going to turn my back on the sinful worship that I had been living, and I'm going to start worshiping and living for Yahweh, Jehovah, Jesus Christ. So when they turned, it's another way of saying that they repented. Now, The idols that the Thessalonians turned from, they were superstitious. They didn't really exist. Now, demons are real, and there's a demonic influence probably behind quite a bit of this worship that Josh spoke about there in Bulgaria. Oh, demons are real. But when somebody carves something out of a tree, when somebody makes something out of a piece of metal, when they make a piece of pottery that is in the shape and form of one of the gods that they supposedly worship, those gods aren't real. But even though you and I might not be worshiping such superstitious gods, we may very well be worshiping more sophisticated gods, more sophisticated idols. Some of you... Some of you may have drove one of your idols to church this morning. Or you left it in the garage. Some of you left one of your idols in the form of your home. Some of you may have actually ridden in the same vehicle with your idol. It can be a family member. It can be a girlfriend, boyfriend. Some of you, you will slave away this afternoon and or tomorrow morning and all week long in worship of your God, money. Some of you, it is, it is your sphere of fame and power. Man, that's, that's what you're after. And so even though maybe we as believers have turned, there has been that initial moment at the point of our salvation when we turn from sin and we forsook all gods and we began to worship the true and living God, the repenting needs to be ongoing. It is initial to begin our Christian experience and then it is ongoing as needed thereafter. Um, Someone might ask, okay, so I thought we were saved by faith and I don't see faith mentioned here. It just talks about turning. Faith in God and turning to God are basically the flip side of the same coin. Let's imagine that I've got written on the top part of my hand, turn or repent. And on this side, I've got the word faith. All right, so you're seeing faith right now. As I turn my hand and you see faith, was that two actions or one? It was basically one action. I just simply turned my hand one way. Faith and turning. It is coming through faith in Jesus Christ with the realization that he is the way, the truth, the life, and that nobody comes to the Father but by him. And it is the realization at the same time that I put my faith and trust in him, I turn from my sin. I can't turn for you. You can't turn for somebody else. 
and you will not be made to turn. It is a decision that you must make. And so I would just ask you this morning, have you turned to God? It's a vital part of authentic Christian living. A second reality of authentic Christian living, you serve the Lord. You not only turn to God, but you serve the Lord. This speaks to your allegiance. So verse 9 continues. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, the claim to have turned to God from idols is bogus if it does not result in serving the God to whom we say we have turned to. If there's not any serving, it's possible there's not actually been true biblical turning. If there's no serving, there may not have been actually any biblical repenting. So as one person said it, where you once served sin and self, now you serve the living and true God. Where once you bow down to the idols of pleasure and power, material gain and worldly approval, now you bow your knee to Jesus. Where once you serve the dead gods of this world, now you serve the living God. Once you followed falsehood, now you serve the true God. And so this worship of God fleshes itself out in some very practical, tangible ways. Our master gave his life. And so therefore, we do not serve him out of bare duty or obligation. We serve him out of gratitude and love for what he's done for us. Now, according to the research that is reflected in the book Transformational Church, written by Ed Stetzer and Tom Rayner, according to that book, the majority of people in the majority of churches are unengaged in meaningful ministry and mission. They come for the show, but they don't stay for the service. Now, I'm not saying that what we've been doing is a show, but for, for the analogy that they're saying, there are so many people who were unengaged in any kind of meaningful ministry and mission. They come for the show, but they don't stay for the service. They don't actually serve anybody in any kind of way. And folks, I believe our church is full of people who are not being put to use. Full of a lot of people who are actually serving. And I am going to take a lot of the responsibility for that. And I'll explain more about that in just a moment. But I believe we've got a lot of people who are gifted and need to be greeting, organizing, promoting, doing social media, doing photography, doing videography, doing counseling, doing some decorating, doing some planning, doing some entertaining, doing some repairing, doing some feeding, doing some working with children, working with teens or college students. Some of you have got some abilities and they are currently being wasted. And that's not right. That's not right. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each has received a gift. And by the way, the rest of Scripture makes it very plain that Christians might have multiple gifts, but every Christian's at least got one spiritual gift. So as each has received a gift, a grace gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whatever gift or gifts God's given you, he didn't give it to you to just enjoy and admire as you look at yourself in that super sanctified mirror. He gave it to you to not just serve one another. That, that is a key part of it, but also to serve others outside these doors. Romans 12 verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Ministry, properly understood, is about people, not programs. Programs aren't evil. And when you are serving people, you will of necessity have some programs. But it's not all about programs. It's all about people. 
and maybe how programs can help minister to those people. So here's what I'd like for you to do. I would like for you to imagine the work of our church ministry and not just what we do here, but also how we are engaged in God's global ministry. And I would like for you to think about all of that, how we're engaged here and how the various ways we can be involved far beyond the walls of our church. I want you to see it as a huge jigsaw puzzle. Huge. And only the sovereign God of the universe can see all that that looks like. You and I are a piece of that puzzle. I You and I together, as a piece of that puzzle, we fit into it. Not just right by myself, but I am interconnected with some other pieces. You and I, we are all to be interconnected in this whole great big jigsaw puzzle. So, we need to come together and figure out how we fit in that puzzle. Now... Keep the whole puzzle analogy going in your mind. What I have become convicted about and challenged about is what I as your pastor, what we as a staff can do to help you better understand your shape. You're a piece of this puzzle. If you know Jesus, you are a vital piece. A vital piece. So, What's your shape? And how does your shape affect where you fit into this sovereign puzzle of the service of our King and the advancement of God's gospel? Well, this is not original with me, uh, but several churches use this kind of thing. And Michael, when you were talking about 101s, 201s, 301s, and all of that, I mean, some of that kind of stuff they go through is exactly what I'm about to talk about. Let me just give you that word shape as an acrostic. What I'm hoping is maybe by the fall at the latest, we as a staff can help you better understand your shape, what your spiritual gifts are, what your heartbeat is, what your passion is. Because if you know Christ, you've got some, you've got some passion. You've got some ways that you would love to be actively involved and engaged and we're going to talk about, try, try to help you figure out how your abilities, your personality, and your experiences can be used to help serve the God, the true and living God that this scripture talks about. Now, having said all of that, please, I, I, don't, I, don't, want, I don't want anybody unnecessarily mad with me. And I don't even want anybody unnecessarily down in the down in the mouth and discouraged. But the truth of the matter is, some of you already know your shape. But spiritually, you are out of shape. You're out of shape. You haven't been serving in a long, long time. Truth is, you've become lazy. You've become apathetic. You've become sarcastic. You find fault. And I want to submit to you as lovingly but firmly as I can, it is time for you to repent of those kinds of attitudes. It's time for you to repent of your inactivity. It's time for you to repent of not serving the true and living God like these believers were doing and like all believers are supposed to be doing. It's time for some of you to get off the sidelines and get into the action. It's time for you to stop sitting and start serving. Not to gain salvation, but because of your salvation. And I know age can affect things, but uh, (laughs) we've got some people in this room right now in their 80s or 90s that are still serving the true and living God by serving other people. And we've got some people scattered around of various ages and backgrounds and educational experiences, male and female alike, men who are doing a fantastic job of serving the Lord. But my appeal is to those of you who are not. 
um, I, I've kind of got a feeling that the vast majority of us don't look at our current welfare system favorably. I mean, for some of us, we're thinking, man, I got to pay all of these high taxes so some people seemingly can just loaf and get paid for doing much of nothing. Well, guess what? The church has had people on spiritual welfare long before the American welfare system kicked in in 1935. And so what I just want, I, I, I want God's spirit to take the truth that I'm teaching and preaching and apply it. These people turned away from their idols and they began to serve the true and living God. And I want you, those of you who might not currently be engaged, to become engaged. People who are immobile, whether by choice or because of sickness, they become weak. And more often than not, sickly. Muscle tone worsens. They become flabby. They have no energy. They become lethargic. Physical therapists like Cindy Walters and Dustin Jenkins, uh, Dustin Turner, um, wrong Dustin. Um, physical therapists like Cindy and Dustin, they help work with people to get them back toned and to get their muscles back uh, in the kind of condition they need to be in. They can't help you if you've become spiritually atrophied. But the Holy Spirit of God can. Man, He can work in your heart and life. And those of you who might be sitting there thinking, they don't need me. I don't have much to offer. Wrong! You see, not only is there this analogy that I've given you about the jigsaw puzzle and how we all fit together, there's another analogy that Scripture gives us. It's the body. Brandon Hodges had a kidney. That kidney was diseased. And it eventually, that singular organ in his body had an adverse effect on his whole body. So that kidney was removed and he was given another one. This transplanted kidney has been connected to other vital vessels in his body. And now it fits in with the rest of the body and the whole body is serving Brandon, well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, just as the body, talking about the physiological human body, is one and has many members, hands, feet, eyes, toes, ears, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. The body of Christ is one. And yeah, Baba, uh, Baba Dachi, I mean, she is a part of that puzzle. She got fitted into this beautiful, sovereign, uh, multinational, multi-ethnic piece of uh, our puzzle of this sovereign God of ours. She's a part of the puzzle. She's a part of the body. Those Bulgarian believers and we Pitt County believers, we're all a part of this one body. And what we got to do is figure out how we're supposed to help make the overall body function well. Jesus said it in John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, folks, he did not say that just to 12. He said that by application to all. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. That tells me that God's people are sent on mission. I didn't necessarily say that all of God's people are sent on missions, but all God's people are to be on mission. I, there, there is a mission that God's given me. God's given you. Are you fulfilling it? So don't miss it. All of God's people are sent on mission and all of God's people are called to ministry. The only questions are where, among whom, and doing what? Where, among whom, and doing what? And for some of you, it'll be here amongst the kids changing diapers. For some of you, it may eventually be among the Bulgarians building a building as a career missionary and helping build another one of these churches. What's your mission? 
three, real, three realities of serving, I mean, three realities of authentic Christian living. You turn to God, you serve the Lord. Number three, you wait for Christ. So, uh, word had been spread how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, probably all of us can relate at least somewhat to this. You've got a doctor's appointment, and you get there at the appointed time, and you wait. And you wait. Oh, forgot to mention this. You didn't bring anything to read. Your phone died as you came in the doors. There's no magazines anywhere to be found. The doctor, all of them, they are completely overwhelmed. And so you just wait. 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 You unproductively wait. That's not the kind of waiting we're talking about here. The waiting is an anxious, this speaks to your endurance. As you continue to live the Christian life, you are working and waiting. You don't just sit on your spiritual backside and wait for the Lord to come back and take care of all this mess. You don't just wait for the Lord to come back and right all the wrongs. You don't just wait for God to come back and set up some kind of a utopia here on earth. That ain't happening. Not right now. It'll eventually happen. But there's a lot that's got to take place between now and then. So while I am ever waiting, anxiously so, longingly so, I am to be working, waiting and working, waiting and working. Working and serving, working and waiting go hand in hand together. There's no liberty offered in verse 10 to idleness. There's no Allowance for indifference. I'm just going to sit and wait. No. Serve. Work. Wait. And keep your eye on the Lord. So, imagine with me, there's a wife. Her husband's been off to war. Uh, he's supposed to be gone for at least 12 months. Could be shorter. And so, sure enough, after he's been gone for six, she gets notification that his tour of duty has been shortened, but we don't know exactly when he's coming home. Do, do you think that that wife, anxious for her husband to come back home, just sits and waits? Oh, I forgot to tell you there's three kids. We'll, we'll, even, we'll, we'll make it four just to honor Josh and Kevin. Um, no, she's going to be serving those kids, cleaning that home, preparing herself, and just ever so often glancing out the door. Just, And then when she gets notification that today's the day, I guarantee you, no matter how late he may be, she is waiting up for him. That's the same imagery here. We are working we are serving, finding out where our peace fits in the puzzle, what our shape is, and how we're to be involved in serving the Lord. And we're constantly waiting, waiting up for the Lord's return. Two things about this Savior we're waiting for. We wait for Christ, who was our resurrected Savior, whom he raised from the dead. And we wait for Christ, who is our returning deliverer, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Um, road rage. I'm not even sure when that began to be a term. I don't remember ever using the words, the words road rage when I was in college. So I think road rage has kind of become something we're familiar with in the last 20 years or so. Um, road rage is uncontrollable, unpredictable anger. That usually is merely because somebody pulled out in front of somebody and slowed them down, made them hit their brakes. That kind of rage, again, is unpredictable. It is unreasonable. Just like the 
rage and the wrath that the Thessalonians perceived their gods to have. They were capricious and they offered their sacrifices just hoping to appease. God's wrath is not like that. God's wrath, it is his settled opposition to and displeasure with sin. God's wrath is not capricious. God's wrath is not unpredictable. It is his settled, fervent displeasure toward sin. And the wrath that is made reference to here, he has sent Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. I'm convinced that's talking about eternal judgment, eternal wrath. Um, Several weeks ago, I discovered this police activity YouTube channel. They do not post what they post because of goriness or trying to promote that kind of thing. But it's real live shots of what takes place in police officers' lives. And they are used as teaching tools for officers to learn from. I saw just the still image of this like two or three days ago. I actually watched it this morning. 911 call is made, and someone is pretty um, um, semi hysterical saying, There's been a bad wreck. I Man, this, this, this car's gonna blow up. Man, it's on fire. It's gonna blow up. You gotta send somebody here. So, long story short, police officer, you know, he's got his uh, cam recorder on, he's recording everything. He gets there. This, this car has hit a, a sizable tree, and man, it, it, is, it is a lot of flames. Man, Man, duty bound. I'm called to serve. He goes back, gets a fire extinguisher. The heat is just unbearable. And he's just, that little fire extinguisher was no match for those flames. Because of the impact into the tree, the frame was crunched. And so all the doors were jammed. There's this guy. Man, he's writhing in pain. His right shoulder must have probably was broken out of joint or whatever. And man, he is so You can see it in his eyes, man. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. I don't know whether it required a little bit of superhuman or God enabled him, but man, you can see the the officer bends that door frame enough that it provides just of enough opening. He's got that guy, and he's while he's pulling him out, the engine exploded. It blows his camcorder off, blows his hat off. But then next thing you know, you, you, you know, you can just see it just rolling all over the floor or all over the ground. And next thing you know, the guy has been delivered. He wasn't the only one. The driver died and burned. That police officer delivered that young man from a fiery death. Jesus has delivered us from a fiery hell. And so we're to be serving him, so thankful for what he's done, so thankful for pulling us from the fires of hell. And we're to be waiting for him to return because he's going to do it. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. So my question this morning, let's go full circle. Are you a part of God's elect? Have you expressed your faith such that it evidenced itself in you turning from sin and the life you're living now is different than it used to be? And are you serving the Lord because you're just thankful for what he's done for you? And are you prepared and anxiously just waiting for whenever he might return? That is authentic Christian living. Let's pray.